Hello and welcome to this panel discussion on who belongs at the Thanksgiving table, immigration, religion, and the 400th anniversary of the first Thanksgiving. We've assembled a panel of three outstanding historians to help us think through the contested legacy of the pilgrims and of Thanksgiving, a holiday that amidst all the food and family and friends and football uh, raises important questions around historical memory and national identity. My name is Judd Bertzall and I serve as a senior research fellow uh, at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs at Georgetown University. And we're delighted to be hosting uh, today's webinar in partnership with the history department at Georgetown. Uh, this webinar is related to a larger project that's being managed by Gordon College in Massachusetts. Uh, Matt Rowley, one of our uh, panelists today is a key architect of uh, the project. And so I've asked him uh, in a minute to say a bit more about um, that project. But let me just highlight a couple of the uh, project uh, outputs. Uh, the first is this uh, special issue of the Review of Faith and International Affairs uh, on this theme of, of Thanksgiving, it has articles from our um, three panelists today, as well as one uh, from me. Uh, second, just this morning, uh, we have published a, a compilation of essays on the theme, Who Belongs at the Thanksgiving Table, uh, at the Berkeley Forum, which is our center's uh, online uh, commentary platform. Uh, and this compilation uh, features a sort of op-ed length um, uh, essays uh, from, again, the four of us, as well as several other uh, scholars. And I believe the uh, link to that forum is now in the Zoom chat. The um, uh, format for today's webinar is quite straightforward. I've asked each of our panelists to speak for about uh, 10 minutes, and then we'll use uh, the remainder of our time for engagement uh, with you, uh, the audience. If you have a question, you can type it at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, please do be as brief as you can be in phrasing uh, your question and let us know uh, to whom you are addressing uh, your brief uh, question. This webinar is being recorded and a captioned video will be posted uh, on our um, event page uh, in, the, in the coming days. And if you registered for today's event, you'll receive uh, an email with the link uh, to that video. Well, it's my pleasure now to introduce our panelists and I'll introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Uh, Dr. Matthew Rowley is an honorary fellow in the history department at the University of Leicester in England, where he earned his PhD. He's the author most recently of Trump and the Protestant Reaction to Make America Great Again. And he has several more book projects uh, in the works. Uh, Dr. Christine Arnold Lurie is a professor of history and chair of the humanities and social sciences at the College of Southern Maryland. Her research interests include American history, women in Europe, and the history of race and racism. Dr. Peggy Bendroth is a historian of American religion and the former executive director of the Congregational Library and Archives in Boston. Her work focuses on American religious history, especially fundamentalists and modern liberal Protestants, as well as urban religion and women and gender. Well, a very warm welcome to all of our panelists. Thanks for being with us. Thanks to all of our audience members for joining us as well today. Uh, Matt, let's let's begin with you. If you could tell us a bit more about uh, this project, the ideas uh, and goals animating it, and something of the, the contribution that you've made to this collective effort uh, to reflect on uh, the meaning and legacy of Thanksgiving at 400. Matt, over to you. All right. Thank you, Judd. And also thank you, uh, Peggy and Christine, for your participation, not only in this project, but in the much larger project. So in I haven't totaled it up, but my guess is that somewhere around 15 other scholars and authors have participated in some way in writing about the contested legacy of Thanksgiving for this 400th anniversary. And the project really started for me in 2019 as I started looking forward, um, thinking how should Americans responsibly remember Thanksgiving in a way that is both, uh, the, in, a, in a way that is historically accurate but also sensitive to the concerns that we have in the present. Uh, little did I expect, little did anyone really expect uh, the events of the summer of 2020 after the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent debates over history that would really propel national memory into the spotlight. 
And I, I wrote the Trump book trying to explore how American Protestants uh, remember and forget the past and how they deal with the more controversial aspects, particularly racism, sexism, and exploitation. Um, but this project was a bit different. This was really focused on one single event and, and the memory of that event over the centuries. And so we've had some excellent contributors showing just the many different ways in which the pilgrims and their legacy has been used over the, uh, the last 400 years. What I'm gonna do right now is explore my article for the review of faith and international affairs uh, that Judd mentioned earlier. And I wanna explore that article through three different images. So the first is a table, the second is a map, and the third is a boat. So first, in this project, I began thinking of the nation as a table. If the nation is a table, perhaps a Thanksgiving one, who belongs around it? Who is the host and who the guest? What are the criteria for inclusion and who gets to decide? As we debate these questions, we must never forget that the wood was carved from the trees of the Native American forest, sits squarely on their ancestral land, and they are seated at the table demanding a voice. So not only is th this table metaphor that um, part of the collection where several of the authors talk about belonging and, and who sits around, um, also my article focuses on um, on migration and borders and maps. So my article for the collection framed all of American history from pre-colonial to colonial to United States history as a series of many great migrations. And these migrations were really three different types. And, and I'm gonna overview these three different types. Those, those were first, migration within borders, second, migration into borders, and third, the migration of borders themselves. And each one of these migrations prompts fundamental questions of identity, belonging, and diversity. And at each stage, history plays a very important part. So first, migration within borders. Scholars in recent years have done an excellent job in arguing that indigenous communities from pre-colonial times were dynamic and diverse. They were anything but static. And so there was incredible movement within the indigenous communities, but with the advent of colonialism, that movement took on a different form. So first there was uh, a movement of Europeans in, into the Eastern seaboard. And then over time, increasingly, uh, the indigenous experience is marked by a forced migration further west or a, a movement onto reservations or a movement onto an internment camp in Deer Island in, in the Boston Harbor. Um, it becomes marked by a very different type of movement uh, that is often a coerced form. Um, so this migration within borders is part and parcel of American history. We could look just about at any point and there's movement. And e even in the present, uh, one of the big issues that we face as Americans in the present is this ideological movement that is taking place where people are actually moving into communities that agree with them politically and, and increasingly becoming part of an echo chamber where you assume that your side is all that there is because all the people that you know are that way. And, um, and all the people who live in other towns and vote differently, they're from a different time and a different place. Uh, so from colonial times up to the present, there's been movement within borders. And one of the big ones that I explore in the book is what's known as the Great Migration. And there are really three great migrations in American history. And the first one is, uh, is in colonial times, the Pilgrims and the Puritans. The second uh, is, Native, is uh, African Americans as they are moving north. Um, and then the third one is Irish Americans as they, as they are coming over. And with the, with the second great migration of African Americans moving north for a variety of reasons, some are, are pulled by the promise of a better life, others are pushed by racial policies in the South and violence in the South. And it's a combination of the two. But the movement of African Americans within the United States prompts fundamental questions of identity, inclusion, and belonging both for those peoples who are moving 
and also for the peoples among whom they move. Same thing happens with the Irish when they come over. And the Irish really have several strikes against them when they come to the United States. So they're not only Irish, which is, which, which is associated with barbarism, um, they're also Catholic by and large. They're also uh, poor. And so you have several of these different um, strikes against them. And, and, and a fourth strike is the fact that they weren't legally considered white. And so within Irish history, there is this fight to be considered fully American, fully Christian, fully white, and all the problems that um, arise with, with, with such a, a, a contest among the Irish themselves. And often once the Irish achieve that status, then they exclude others from those very categories. So there's not only a migration within the borders of the United States, there's also a migration into, board, into the borders of what is now the US. And we're really looking at Thanksgiving and the pilgrims and, and, and it's that migration probably more than anything that stands out as a founding moment in American memory. Um, Americans could very easily pick other founding moments. They could uh, appeal to, to Swedish uh, colonies or to the Dutch or to the Spanish. They could pick many different founding moments or they could do as the 1619 project does and highlight uh, how early uh, African-Americans were here forcibly brought to the United States. Um, and in, in this collection of essays, Abraham Van Engen very excellently says that we shouldn't be trying to pick out the founders of the United States. So he says, quote, America has too many founders and all of them matter. Uh, so this migration into borders not only takes place during colonial history, but it just picks up over time. There is an increasing uh, um, movement into the US, whether it is Germans into the Midwest or Scots into the Appalachians and a continual movement, Asians into the West Coast. And each time with each, with each um, movement of peoples, we have these issues of national identity, belonging, and diversity that come up. The third type of movement is the, is the movement of the borders themselves. So the borders of the United States expanded so rapidly, not only along the Eastern seaboard, but as ideas of manifest destiny took hold uh, with, with increasing providential force, the movement west and west, and people started fantasizing about taking over parts of Canada and, and over Mexico. And then the borders continue to move. And these borders expand out into the Pacific or they encompass, um, they encompass places like Puerto Rico and, um, and Cuba and, and the Philippines and Hawaii are all brought into this. And this expansion of borders really prompts two different types of questions of identity and belonging in American history. Uh, for many whites, they wanted the borders to expand, but they didn't necessarily want the peoples who were already living there to come into the nation on equal footing. And so there's that, that fear that, that these people who are now incorporated geographically into the United States are gonna upset this experiment that started with the pilgrims or at least they, they argue that it started with the Pilgrims and Puritans. Um, so there's the migration of, of borders themselves, but for the people who the borders have now encompassed them, right? It can properly be said that they didn't cross the border, but the border crossed them. And they have questions of identity and inclusion and belonging. How do they fit into this nation that has now encompassed them and their lands? And so my argument in framing American history that way is to show that these questions that we have in the present about identity, inclusion, and belonging that are sparked by immigration and movement, these questions are not new in any way. And that we can learn from history and learning from history involves uh, looking at the bad, but then also looking at the good. And then the third image that I develop in the article, and I'll just very briefly go over this one, is, um, is the American history as a boat or as a ship. And think of the Mayflower here. So if the Mayflower is, is moving along very quiet waters, it sends ripples in opposite directions. 
So the ripples move from the Mayflower in polar opposite directions. And as, as uh, Peggy and Christine and John, Judd have shown in their articles, American history itself can be used for polar opposite ends. You can look at the same exact persons and event, events in history and arrive at very different conclusions. And so just by way of example, the, the, the ripples that are left by the Mayflower crash on pro-immigrant shores, and they also crash on anti-immigrant shores. So you can say, you, because the pilgrims came, because we are a nation of immigrants, therefore we should welcome the immigrant. Or other people will say, well, because you're not of the pilgrim or Puritan stock, therefore you can't become fully part of American history. And so, especially in light of uh, the events of 2020, remembering this complex history has become more important than ever. And we need to recover that sense in which uh, there is a lot of good in history, but there is a lot of bad. And we can look at the ways in which American history can be used for very different purposes. And I, I think my article was, was um, a plea that we need to remember history accurately, but also choose a better path with how we use our history. Thank you. And thank you, Matt, for your remarks and your image there of the wake of the Mayflower uh, is a very nice segue to Christine's uh, remarks, which I believe she'll talk about how uh, appeals to the pilgrims and, and their legacy has had real life uh, consequences. Uh, so thank you again, Matt and Christine, over to you. All right, um, thank you. And I'm not sure why, all right. Thank you very much. Um, and Matt, your, your talk was a perfect segue into where I begin. If you're an aficionado of old black and white movies, there's a category of film that I call World War II foxhole movies. And in these movies, there's always, you know, the tough Italian kid from Brooklyn and the, the Jewish guy, he's always got glasses on, he's supposed to be more scholarly. But somehow, America is portrayed as a very successful, multi-ethnic community of people united in their fight against fascism and to preserve democracy. And if you watch those movies, it's a very, very appealing, appealing image. And in this same period of World War II, in 1945, Hollywood screenwriter Albert Maltz created a short film aimed at children, um, American children. It was based on a song. The song was written by Earl Robinson and Abel Mirapol, about, which, about whom I could tell you a bit later. It's called The House I Live In. And this little 10 minute film portrays America as a place of a hundred different kinds of people and a hundred different ways of going to church. This is an incredibly inclusive vision of America, but it comes less than two decades after Congress had passed the most restrictive immigration laws in the nation's history, targeting arrivals from Asia and Southern and Eastern Europe. While the film described sectarian bigotry as un-American, an older narrative remained powerful. Many Americans continued to adhere to the notion of the United States as a unique nation rooted in the idealism of the pilgrims and the Puritans and deriving its values and its purpose from its Protestant Anglo-Saxon heritage. That belief was and has been invoked at critical points in American history and it provided comfort to those to whom it appeared true and helped to justify policies designed to discriminate against and marginalize those whose backgrounds and beliefs marked them as outsiders. Now we know that many factors influence the passage of restrictive immigration policies, but the justification for those laws drew from a foundational past that sacralized the memory of the pilgrims and privileged New England exceptionalism as the source of American greatness. It confirmed the ideal of an America that had actually never existed. America was never just about white Anglo-Saxon Protestants sitting in New England. As Matt mentioned in 1619, before the pilgrims show up, there are Africans living in Virginia. 
But this idea has consequences, sometimes fatal consequences for those who did not share that cultural and religious heritage. Over time, the stories of the pilgrims and the Puritans became the American story and helped shape the nation's identity. When faced with challenges to their exclusive claim to that narrative, the descendants of those early settlers enlarged upon the achievements of their ancestors and disregarded not just the contributions, but even the legitimacy of other groups. This narrative persisted and perhaps even strengthened as the nation becomes more diverse with those waves of immigrants that uh, Matthew discussed. That first wave, of course, is the Irish. But as the nation becomes more diverse and theories of racial hierarchy and immutab immutability also gain traction. And through that 19th century, public discourse increasingly reflects the connection between race and religion. Um, in 1885, this connection is made, I think most powerfully by the Reverend Josiah Strong, who wrote a book called Our Country, Its Possible Future and Its Present Crisis. This book was a bestseller, 200,000 copies, which is a lot of books in 1885, even today. And Strong makes explicit the connection between early New England Protestantism, American democracy, and Anglo-Saxon superiority. For Strong, what drove the pilgrims to New England wasn't just religion, but their Anglo-Saxon inheritance. He says the Anglo-Saxon is the representation of two great ideas which are closely related, civil liberty and pure spiritual Christianity. For those not paying attention, that's a slam at Catholicism, which is seen as idolatrous in its practices and vestments and statues and incest, in, incense and all of that, stained glass windows. So St Strong tells us that the great reformation of the 16th century, of course, came from Germany because it derived from the Anglo-Saxon instinct for liberty, and that that had given birth to everything that made America great. This conflation of religion and race creates a permanent barrier for those who arrived after that first wave of settlers, and the pilgrim legacy becomes a cudgel wielded against those whose race and faith makes them incapable of understanding American values. And when Matt says the Irish are not white, in fact, he is absolutely right. They don't get white for a long time. There are a few voices that do emerge to counter this narrative, highlighting the benefits of immigration and diversity. In 1906, California's progressive governor, George Pardee, envisions a new America, and he looks at the Thanksgiving feast differently. He sees it symbolized by the celebration of Thanksgiving Day, while the feast originated in what he calls the narrow theocratic community on Massachusetts Bay. Now it belongs to, in common possession, Puritan and Cavalier, Baptist, Quaker, Catholic, and Jew which is a really lovely image, but it's not the prevailing image in the early 20th century. But the image remains powerful. As opposition to their increasing numbers grows, Catholics and Jews attempt to legitimize their presence by claiming the mantle of the pilgrims as their own. Uh, Catholic historian Edward Galbally said it's the Maryland pilgrims, and note that he calls them Maryland pilgrims. They're Catholic. Not the people who come on the Mayflower. It's the Maryland pilgrims who deserve to be seen as the true source of liberty of conscience in America. Rabbi Nathan Krass tells Americans, you know, Jews gave the world Moses and Jesus, 
and Paul and the Bible. And then he says, imagine what would have happened if a committee of Indian immigration officers had stood on Plymouth Rock and after admitting 10 pilgrim fathers had said, well, your quota is full, the rest of you go back to England. Now, despite the efforts of some leaders to portray recent arrivals as the spiritual, if not the racial or religious descendants of the pilgrims, throughout the early decade, the first decades of the 20th century, New England lawmakers and academics strove to curb the arrival of those whom Francis Walker, who was the president of MIT, called beaten men from beaten races. And what my research showed was that not only was the Puritan and Pilgrim legacy invoked over and over as the reason for denying admission to those who didn't match up, this, this was driven by New England academics and New England politicians and New England scientists. And that I think was to me a revelation. So with leadership from Vermont Senator uh, William Dillingham, Congress responds by passing a series of increasingly restrictive immigration laws. This culminates in 1930 with a revision to the quota system designed to preserve the existing racial composition of the nation by developing this really complicated uh, metric for determining the proportion of the white population of the country that had descended from that enumerated in the first national census. The new law, of course, restricted overall immigration, which it wasn't intended to do, but it differentiated between colonial stock and post-colonial stock. And the new quotas privileged nations that had provided the highest percentage of early arrivals and, then, and thus staunched the flow of Catholic and Jewish immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. In the face of growing anti-immigrant hostility, Catholic historian John Edward Byrne wrote, Protestantism is essentially nationalistic. Protestants simply assume that this is a Protestant country and that therefore Protestant ascendancy must be maintained. Behind restrictionist debates, Byrne said, there have ever laid these two perennial bogies fear of Romanism and fear of the immigrant. Many nations saw their quotas reduced as a result of the 1930 law, but no group felt that impact more painfully than the Jews of Germany, because those laws go into effect at exactly the time when the Jews of Germany become desperate to get out. That wave of immigrants come to America had hit those shores too. But of course, we know how that story ends. Now, historians have, have thought a lot about how to explain America's reluctance to admit the Jews of Germany. And we know that Americans' indifference to those refugees' plights had many causes but it had also been influenced by political and religious and intellectual leaders who justified the passage of increasingly restrictive legislation aimed at somehow reconstituting the ideal colonial population. These laws proved impervious to pleas from the very people lawmakers had intended to exclude from their perception, these laws were working just the way they were meant to. Generations of privileging Protestantism above other faiths militated against empathy for those whose faith made them undesirable. And that rhetoric shaped post-war policy as well as millions of displaced persons desperately awaited refugee status, 
1948 Displaced Persons Bill, which President Truman denounced as flagrantly discriminatory, privileged agricultural workers, which is a code for let's not let the Jews in, and Baltic Protestants fleeing uh, communism. So as it had in the past, the nation acted to restrict the entry of Catholics and Jews. And the idea of America as a white Protestant nation prevailed. The 1965 Immigration Act abolished the quota system that had been designed to restrict the arrival of Catholics and Jews. But the struggle between the appeal of the American narrative and the ownership of that story continues. Uh, we know that today, as the nation confronts its history of slavery, some states attempt to ban educators from even discussing the country's painful history of racial, religious, and ethnic conflict, um, calling for something called patriotic education. And so, in the face of reemergent white nationalism, anti immigrant rhetoric, attacks against Asians and Jews and Muslims, we see Confederate monuments topple, schools, including my alma mater, uh, high school, being renamed, and Americans continue to debate not just their past, but the future of this house in which we all live and try to decide who gets to call it home. Great. Thank you so much, Christine, for uh, those comments. Uh, Peggy, uh, to you. Um, so if, if, if appeals to the pilgrims have been used to exclude those who uh, aren't Protestant, you show that even within Protestantism, there's been quite a contestation over the, the pilgrim legacy. Tell us a bit about that. Yes. So. Um... My story is a little um, bit different, and it, it's, um, I was very, I, I um, was, as, as you said, director of the Congregational Library in Boston for uh, many years, and this library uh, had uh, a curious amount of Puritan and Pilgrim artifacts. We had a desk from Scrooby Parish. We had uh, a large rock. Um, which I told people for years was from Plymouth. And then I began to wonder how I actually knew that. <laughs> but uh, these are Congregationalists who are, you know, the descendants of the original Pilgrims and Puritans, anti any kind of um, icons or sacred objects who are storing them uh, assiduously. So I, um, so I became very curious about this Pilgrim legacy and particularly how it, um, how people are in the 19th century and on into the 20th um, reacted to it, owned it, argued about it. Um, and of course, uh, you know, I wrote the story about congregationalists and how they uh, owned, uh, learned to love the Puritans and the Pilgrims in a book called The Last Puritans. Um, but in researching this paper, I discovered a, a, an even richer conversation that um, is instructive to us because it uh, touches on how historical legacies are, um, are created, how we connect to them, how we don't connect to them. And, it, you know, and as the previous speakers um, have said, who gets to connect and who doesn't. Um, but this is a story that takes place uh, earlier. And so um, one of the first sets of arguments about the pilgrims actually took place in the early 19th century uh, down in Plymouth, where, you know, in 1820, Daniel Webster famously gave a speech that, you know, uh, that dubbed the, pure, the pilgrims the first in a line of American pioneers. Um, he did this in a church that um, Orthodox Congregationalists would have found offensive. The, all across New England in the early 19th century, uh, Congregationalists, the original descendants of these pilgrims and Puritans, were breaking into over matters of theology that you know we don't want to go into now, um, but also matters of property and buildings and so forth. It was um, 
by the standards of the time, very intense. Uh, little love lost between this group. And so at, down in Plymouth, they began every year kind of an, uh, an annual sparring contest. The uh, Trinitarian, conservative, Orthodox, Congregationalist uh, were quick to say that, you know, we are the true sons of the Pilgrim Fathers because they left England in order to, uh, to flee bad doctrine. And they came here to establish a pure church and a pure faith just the way, uh, you know, that Jesus and the apostles would have wanted it to be. The Unitarians, for their part, said, well, not really. Uh, to, the word pilgrim actually means seeker. Um, and we are the true heirs of the pilgrims because we are religious seekers. We are more liberal. We are more exploratory in our faith. And, you know, these are people on the move. Uh, we, uh, we own them. And so, you know, these debates, as you read about them today, they're, um, they're very intense. They're uh, very impolite by 19th century standards. They're sometimes humorous, but it became clear to me that, you know, Unitarians eventually uh, opted out of the debate, but Congregationalists took that pilgrim story, that identification with these, with their origins during a time when, you know, they weren't yet a national, you know, uh, uh, symbol as they would become. And they use that historical identity point in order to become modern. They were a very, you know, if anybody knows anything about congregationalists, very decentralized. Every church stands on its own. United States religious culture is very competitive. You need to um, be organized and get out there and you know, uh, evangelize and send out resources. Uh, Congregationalists were very poor at doing this and they knew that. And so in order to unify, to revamp their, their institutional structure, as it were, they needed those pilgrims to do that. And so the first uh, statement of faith that they had collectively made since the 17th century was literally penned on a trip down to Plymouth and uh, uh, accepted by acclamation on top of Burial Hill where, you know, the remains of those first Puritan settlers were. And so, you know, it's an example of how historical legacies looking to the past can allow people to embrace change. It gives you an anchor point from which you can move forward. Um, but it doesn't always work that way. And it's fascinating that people in the 19th century, really Protestants, you know, if we break down that category a little bit more, um, they saw themselves in that story with an immediacy um, that sometimes surprises us. In 1844, at a meeting of the uh, New England Society in New York City, uh, you know, kind of displaced New Englanders in the wilds of, uh, beyond the Hudson River would have these annual events. Um, and according to newspaper reports, as the evening wore on, um, there were, you know, a lot of toasts to the pilgrim, uh, pilgrims and the Puritan fathers, more and more kind of fueled by alcohol um, and uh, culminating in uh, Massachusetts Senator Rufus Choate's uh, toast to a church without a bishop uh, and a country without a king. This is an old kind of rhyme, but uh, you know, you kind of get the point. A church without a bishop and a country without a king. Uh, and the bishop, soon to be bishop of uh, New York diocese was sitting there taking it all on the chin and becoming very, very angry. What's interesting is what happened afterwards, um, that there was a way to manage religious conflict and to be able to, uh, to work through this historical legacy, but um, in a way that scholars will appreciate. Um, Jonathan Wainwright, this uh, gentleman, uh, published a lengthy series of letters. It went out in the newspapers and later became kind of a published book slash pamphlet about why the Episcopal system, you know, remember these are the bad guys in the Puritan story. Um, why that system is the most biblical. And he very politely allowed a Presbyterian colleague to write a rejoinder. And anyone looking at that would have said, well, isn't this lovely? You know, these, this is religious civility at its finest. Um, unless you looked at the footnotes and um, uh, a great deal of that publication is, is basically single spaced 
footnotes that Wainwright had allowed a friend, an anonymous friend of his, to add to the text that were absolutely venomous. Absolutely venomous. Uh, he got his point across. He didn't have to say it. He kept it in the footnotes. Uh, and in 1846, he was able to return to this New England society and uh, everybody was happy. So there, you know, I think this story shows how people felt that historical legacy. They were still living into it. They still burned with irritation. Uh, when a Baptist criticized or an Episcopalian took umbrage uh, because that legacy was still that present. What we've seen after that, and again, you can summarize vast amounts of material, and I'm going to do that, is that um, in a way, as the Pilgrim story became nationalized, as it became broadened, um, you have more and more religious groups who are able to own into it and say, this is our story. It's a, it's a good thing in the late 19th century. Um, uh, but, you know, and of course there are, are, are limits to this, but it also in a sense belongs to everybody and to nobody. And I think, uh, you know, some of what the um, other presenters are describing is really kind of almost a post-Protestant nationalized um, uh, Pilgrim story that would not have been recognizable to people in the 19th century who are really trying to come to grips with what history meant to them, how it created their identities. Um, you know, the, the phrase that's often used to describe modern people is that we are trapped in the present, that we're an eternal present, and we look at the past as another country, as those people, nothing that has a direct connection to us, you know, so we're very able to say, well, that's, you know, that's not, I'm not responsible for that, or uh, those people did that, uh, you know, we're very easy, it, it's much easier for for us from this kind of position of uh, being trapped in our present world, uh, seeing the past as something back there or down there or before us and not organically connected to who we are today. So in a sense, you know, my article makes a, in some ways a much smaller point that this legacy has been contested um, in, and uh, and the uh, disputes solved in in some creative ways and in some useful ways for people. Um, but you know that fact that there are so few specifically religious voices of Latter Day Congregationalists or Baptists or Episcopalians today in the debate about this story is to me very telling. That in, that uh, in a sense we've lost that immediate. Um, connection with the past and we can trivialize it, we can caricature it, we can use it for political purposes because uh, because you know we we no longer feel that kind of connection. So I think that's probably enough and I know people are probably waiting with questions. Great. Thank you so much uh, Peggy and thanks to all of our panelists. A reminder to our audience um, to uh, submit your question if you have one. Um, uh, do do phrase it as, as briefly as you can and let us know uh, which panelist or, or if the question is for all panelists, let us know um, that as well. Feel free to give us your institutional affiliation uh, if you would like. Um, let me just kick things off by um, asking a question, particularly on the on the tradition of uh, Thanksgiving or remembering the first Thanksgiving. This can be for any of the panelists, um, just as Peggy was talking about how um, there's been this uh, intra-Protestant squabble over who is the rightful heir of, of the, the Pilgrim uh, legacy. And of course that has had dramatic implications as, as Christine pointed out. There's been a similar sort of debate as to what the first Thanksgiving was all about and who, who, um, who was there and what is, the, what is the ongoing sort of spirit or meaning of, or essence of, of that event. Um, the article that I wrote for the special issue was about presidential proclamations. And it was interesting to see how different presidents highlight different things. And just uh, in the past decade, um, Obama really, really emphasized the Native American contribution to not only that, that feast, but also to the rest of um, colonial and US history. Uh, President Trump presented the, the, the first Thanksgiving as very much a story about the pilgrims and their, their heroism, their religiosity, their determination, and there's sort of a 
a bit a bit actor reference to uh, the Wampanoag uh, contribution. So, uh, in, in, any reflections on that 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 debate over time and and in the contemporary scene in terms of what the first Thanksgiving uh, was really all about? Yeah, I think just as a as a really short comment on it, the surprising thing is how little the first Thanksgiving mattered in historical memory for such a long time. And it's, it really is much later generations that uh, fixate on that as a, as, as a moment of significant national importance. Peggy or Christine, you wanna follow up I, on the- I would also add that the, 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 the original celebrations were Founders Day, December 20. Uh, 2021, when they, they the when they disembarked at Plymouth, so congregate, you know, Founders Day had a much more uh, religious valence to it in the 19th century about who gets to celebrate Founders Day. When Abraham Lincoln makes Thanksgiving a national holiday, you know, New England had a long tradition of Thanksgiving feasts and fasts, and you know, they did it was part and parcel of their you know, religious culture for centuries, when it becomes a national holiday in a, in a sense that displaces Founders Day. Uh, we don't even celebrate that. They called it Forefathers Day, actually. Um, uh, and so, you know, that's almost a measure of that secularization taking place or nationalization. Picking up on um, Christine's comments around um, the Anglo-Saxon identity of, of the, the pilgrims and the sort of Anglo-Saxon essentialism that you highlighted one, um, is it Reverend Josiah so-and-so um, articulating that, that it was in the essence of Anglo-Saxons to have or to desire long for uh, civic liberty and this sort of, um, uh, you know, personal spirit, the spiritualized uh, pure uh, Christianity over and against uh, Catholic ritual and iconography and so on. Um, Matt, you and I had a conversation a few weeks ago about how the word Anglo-Saxon doesn't appear in uh, Pilgrim or Puritan literature, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but somehow over time, Pilgrims become Anglo-Saxons, and that is meant, uh, that is taken to mean certain things about who they were and what America is and, and, and should be. I'm wondering, um, also, of course, related to uh, conceptions of, of, of whiteness, which um, Matt and, and uh, Christine talked about. But how, what, what is the process by which um, these, these early modern religious dissenters become Anglo-Saxons or white in the popular imagination? Yeah, so uh, it's very common when you're reading literature critical of the Puritans to find the claim that they came to what is now the United States in order to protect some form of Anglo-Saxon identity. And I had just been hearing that repeated so much in different books that I decided to look into it because you know I consider myself pretty well versed on early colonial literature and I didn't think I had ever come across the word, you know, various forms of Angles or Saxons in the literature. Um, and so uh, a few months ago, I, I went through all the volumes of Massachusetts Bay Colony, all the volumes of Plymouth and what we have left of Rhode Island and Connecticut Colony and Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation and, and you know, Mort's Relations and all, all of those documents just searching, like, do they ever talk about themselves as, as Anglo-Saxons? And I didn't find a single example of that. You'll find a few, uh, a few times in different law codes, people will say, um, you know, they'll make a reference to different laws that uh, that came from Saxony, or, or they'll talk about tax, Tacitus and his his uh, his his um, depictions of the Saxons as liberty-loving people. But it's really as America, as American scientists are developing the the idea of a biological superiority and rooting that biological superiority in in the Anglo-Saxon past, it's at that point that you find often in like the preface to, to a book. So you have Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation. And when the preface, when the preface comes out um, of, for the, the new publication of the book, there's, um, it talks about Bradford and the pilgrims preserving this Anglo-Saxon identity. 
And so it's really centuries after the fact that, you know, as, as racialized white superiority as a biological thing is really being developed, that the pilgrims are seen as defenders of that. Thanks, Matt. Christine, did you want to add uh, to those comments? Well, yes, and, and I think Matt is exactly right. As, as difference is perceived, as Europeans get on boats and sail around and they see difference, um, they seek to explain it. And, you know, encountering people who just don't seem as civilized as we are. And much of, much of the English language around race really originates in their contact with the Irish in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, referring to the Irish as, you know, as Matt says, as barbarous. And how could they be other because they have been brought up in the very puddle of popery. And the English uh, colonists say, don't let your children have um, Irish wet nurses because they will imbibe popery with the milk of these women. And so race is something that it's like, once you catch it, you can't get rid of it. And um, we see that that really imposed upon, when the English come to Virginia, they want to keep the settlers away from the natives. They might catch something. Um, there are other reasons, but there's this sense that there really is something different and special about us, and we don't want it polluted. Um, and that's, of course, right. Nobody talked about Anglo-Saxonism um, in the 17th century. And there is so much irony to the, um, to the use of that term that you see on the lead up to the Civil War when America is about to tear itself apart over race. Um, Harper's Monthly Magazine says that the Anglo-Saxon mind is the hope of the world. It's sublime. It's truth loving and truth seeking and that there's just something special about it. And, um, and that becomes, that does become part of the, the kind of pillaging of the pilgrim legacy and trivializing it that Peggy mentioned. And so we have this, the nobility of, what's, of what can be seen from what happens in Massachusetts. I mean, there's so much fabulous stuff that happens. The first public schools, that's a pretty big deal. Um, partable inheritance, all of these things are true about Massachusetts. But then there's this other stuff that, in a way, the pilgrims might have recognized it. I mean, after all, they were pretty clear about what they didn't, didn't want people thinking and reading and believing. And um, what's the quote the, um, from Massachusetts Bay, where they invite Baptists and Papists and antinomianists to have free liberty to stay away. So that also is baked in. It's a very complicated legacy that we get from the Pilgrims and the Puritans. Thanks, Christine. Uh, and now we have just a few minutes left, but we have several good questions that we can uh, run through. Um, uh, Joseph uh, Stoutzenberger asks a, uh, a question that I, th I thought might come up in our, in our conversation today, and that is referencing the, the recent comments from uh, retired General Michael Flynn, where he said recently at a conference, if we're going to have one nation under God, that means we need to have one religion. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine our panelists uh, differ with Michael Flynn's uh, assessment there, but um, clearly that shows that these issues of, um, you know, what is uh, the essence of um, of, uh, of the United States, uh, is, it, is it still a Protestant country? Uh, still, so there's, there's an undercurrent of, of, of that. So curious, uh, maybe just very briefly, your, in, uh, your initial sort of response as you heard that uh, from Michael Flynn. Can I be the first one to say that it's <laughs> appalling, of course? <laughs> um, but I, you know, I think it's also ridiculous uh, because there has never been one religion mm -hmm. in the United States, uh, and I, I, you know, and part of what 
I was interested in in my paper is, you know, these sparring matches and, and drunken toasts about Thanksgiving and pilgrims. These are um, annual pr uh, exercises, practice in how to do religious diversity. And, you know, they people got really good at it about saying, you know, you are thinking and maybe, you know, in the footnotes, you are as wrong as the day is long, but let's go have dinner together. I mean, that was the American genius that a, a lot of these Protestants, be, you know, had to figure out how to do in the 19th century. Uh, didn't always do it well, especially, uh, you know, drawing that red line when it came to Roman Catholics and others um, and, and racially, of course. Um, but, you know, they, they practiced at it. They did it every Thanksgiving when they argued about whose legacy it was. Thanks, Peggy. Uh, Matt or Christine? I, I would just add to that that um, you know, recent scholarship has really been highlighting the fact that after 1619, with, that, with Africans being forcibly brought over, they're also bringing their religious beliefs with them, including Islam. So we have we have Islam in in our country from you know before the vast majority of Europeans had come in in the colonial era, and so these these questions about what religion has been here, you know, of course Christianity has had an outsized influence on America, uh, for good for ill. Uh, it's been a very mixed legacy, but there there have always been these other beliefs, including uh, indigenous Native American beliefs. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Christine. Uh, I think that's exactly true because the idea that, that there was ever one is of course a false narrative. Just as the idea that America was only ever what was in Massachusetts is also false. Um, it was always a diverse nation. I don't think it set out to be that. I think it became one um, kind of willy nilly. And, um, and there is that moment, and I love that World War II moment of, of what the nation could be. Um, and it's not just those foxhole stories. And I think I'm relating back to what Peggy said, the idea that, that you could have these debates and you could still sit down at the table together. And, and I think in World War II, people work, work really hard to make that come true. Um, I don't know if you all know the story of the four immortal chaplains. That's also uh, becomes a, a story of, it's a World War II story. A troop ship is torpedoed, it's sinking. There are four chaplains, two Protestant ministers, a rabbi and a priest. Sounds like the introduction to a joke, but it's not. <laughs> um, and they refuse offers to take, um, to take the place in the lifeboat, preferring to go down with the men who will not be saved. And that becomes a different way of looking at America. Um, and oh, the post office creates a stamp. And that idea of, as the ship goes down, four people from different religious traditions, but still united, praying with the men who are going to die in the icy waters of the North Atlantic, becomes a really powerful image. Um, and I think there was a, maybe a moment when you might have had some optimism, but the ownership of that American story, as we know, remains contested. Thanks, Christine, Matt, and Peggy for your re reflections there. In the uh, we, we've come to the one hour mark. Um, uh, let me just indulge our audience uh, by going a few minutes over time and combining two of the questions uh, into one, if, if I may. One's from Dennis Hoover, one, uh, one is from Levi Cole. Uh, and to sort of combine them, uh, Dennis asks, uh, could the first Thanksgiving be reimagined and redeemed uh, as a pres precedent for positive pluralism, for cross-faith interaction? One could also say interracial interaction and relational diplomacy. And then Levi asks, on, on a practical social level, what's the best way to communicate and encourage an appreciation for some of the nuance around these contested legacies uh, that we've talked about. So perhaps uh, briefly for, for all three of you, um, can that first Thanksgiving moment, the 1621 moment be redeemed or reimagined or 
be used to sort of encapsulate aspirations toward an interreligious, interracial uh, nation, and then at a practical level, perhaps very practically, as we're gathered around tables uh, next Thursday, and we talk about the meaning and the origin of the day, uh, what are some ways one might um, discuss with uh, sort of the proverbial uncle who uh, may not uh, want to be hearing nuance around the meaning of, of the day? Any guidance you might have um, on that? And if we could sort of go in the, uh, the, the order in which you spoke, so Matt, Christine, and then uh, finish with Peggy. Sure. Uh, I think we need to become skilled at doing two things at the same time with reference to Thanksgiving. So we need to remember the day itself. The day is one of harmony and gratitude and really reaching across ethnic divisions, racial divisions, um, and, and working together. That, that day, I think, has enormous promise for us as a nation moving forward um, towards pluralism and inclusion. So we need to hold that, but we also need to remember what that day became. And that day became a story over time of violence and exclusion. And it is really mixed up with a lot of, a lot of pain. And so um, I think we need to hold on to those two things, the day as it was and what American history became. And, and holding those two things together, I, I think it's exactly that nuance that the proverbial uncle doesn't want around the Thanksgiving table. But I think, I think recovering that is actually essential to our, our moving forward as a nation. Um, thanks. Thank you, Matt. Christine. You know, at a practical level, it already has become that. Thanksgiving is the most American of holidays because anyone can play. Doesn't involve going to church, doesn't involve going to synagogue or anything else. And um, so I, I, I've gotten in the habit of asking my students, how do you celebrate Thanksgiving? Because it already is a multi-ethnic, multi-religious celebration. Um, do you have turkey? Well, yeah, you have to have turkey, but we always have, and you can fill in the blank, we always also have this particular ethnic food or this particular ethnic food. And I think recognizing that whatever the larger argument about um, who gets to claim the story might be doing at any given time, America has always been that place of where you can go to a Thanksgiving and somebody's brought tortillas and somebody's got mac and cheese, which sounds disgusting, but they're not from the North. Um, I mean, seriously. And I think that has already happened and it's acknowledging that. Um, the way that original, that image of America as a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant nation never was true, isn't true now, but people believe in those things that at their best, those images can symbolize. People believe in Thanksgiving as that time. A couple of years ago, Thanksgiving fell on the first night of Hanukkah. So we were calling it Thanksgivinga, and we had latkes. So I think it has, in many ways, it's sort of that there's the argument about it, there's the political argument about it, and then there's the way we live our lives on the ground. And on the ground, it already is. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Peggy. I, I think that's a wonderful point. Um, and I totally agree. I just had a conversation yesterday uh, with a young woman from Brazil. She She's I, tutoring her in English and she's having turkey and, and rice <laughs> for Thanksgiving. Uh, who has rice at Thanksgiving? But if you're from Brazil, you do. Uh, and we both hate pumpkin pie. You know, it's one of those <laughs> things where we kind of bonded over that. Um, and I also, you know, I just think uh, I think the, the the two remarks before mine were just lovely, and I, in the spirit of it, I entirely agree that there is, and the question is brilliant, that there's just so much room for this, you know, in, if, if, if to witness kind of fundamental decency of people um, that we haven't, uh, you know, that we just have forgotten about. And just the practice of gratitude. There are all kinds of psychological studies that <laughs> if you keep a gratitude journal, which I have done, uh, list three things or just be mindful. It's really good for you. 
school. It, it improves your mental health and your physical health. And so, you know, we've made this into, you know, eating and football and all that, but fundamentally it's, holy cow, this is fabulous. I am just grateful to whomever, whatever, however. Um, but there are also many ways that, you know, we can kind of return to that original intent for our own uh, health and well-being. Well, thank you so much, Peggy. That's a wonderful note to end on. Let me thank you and, and Christine and Matt uh, for sharing not only your historical scholarship, but also your very practical wisdom uh, there at the end. Thank you so much for the insights that you've shared with all of us. I want to thank my colleagues at the Berkeley Center for making this event possible. Also our colleagues at the History Department for co-sponsoring it. Uh, thank you to all of us who have joined us uh, virtually. And again, a link to the, uh, the video will be available uh, in just a couple of days. And I wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>